So to my beautiful followers, I want to introduce you to someone who has revolutionized the online space when it comes to creating a cult-like following in doers and dreamers, truly believe that, someone who immigrated from Iran to America, served in the US Army, found an agency that specialized in insurance, marketing, and distribution, just getting started. A strong revolutionary in the entrepreneurial area, founder of Valuetainment, currently we're sitting in the vault, and you know, created a platform all about development and growth. Someone who has inspired people of all walks of age. He has 3.5 million followers just on his personal Instagram account. He's interviewed the greats like Kobe, Mark Cuban, and Kevin Hart, Patrick Red David. It's Welcome. great to be with you. Thank you. Yes. I mean, we're in a bank vault in a podcast, but it's great to be with you. It feels amazing. And you, you may not see this, but her brother's right there. Not her husband, her <laughs> brother's right there. Her mom's right here. Yeah. And we're in a vault in a very safe place. It's, I feel very safe. <laughs> and um, welcome to my channel. First question, how are you feeling today? Good. It's a, it's a Monday. So Mondays are crazy, busy, preparing for the whole week, meeting after meeting after meeting with a great lunch. Very good. Can't complain today, huh? No, no, not at all. Patrick went back and, you know, and I listed all these amazing achievements. If you went back and you said, Patrick, this is going to be your life, or to your parents, mom, dad, this is going to be my life, would they have believed you? And did you believe in yourself? Nobody would have believed it. Nobody would have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it. I was always a dreamer. You have to know, like, I'm the kid that you would walk home from school and I would ask you questions. I would say, so listen, you got four choices. <laughs> you can be Michael Jackson. You can be Michael Jordan. You can be the president of the United States or the richest man in the world. Which one do you want? And we would have a 30 minute debate on which life is a better life to live. Well, I wouldn't want to be the president because too much criticism, but I can make some decisions. I wouldn't want to be the billionaire because, you know, maybe nobody knows who you are, but you can. Well, I would want to be the billionaire because you can buy this sports team. I'd love to be Michael Jordan because you can have it all. We would always dream about how one day, you know, life could turn into the dreams that you dream about as a kid. I did have an uncle, Luther al Hasse, a Syrian man. We would go to his house during the summer. He lived in L.A. in Upland. And we'd go to the street. He lived off of uh, San Antonio. And he had this beautiful 7,200 square foot house, backyard, swimming pool, basketball court, tennis, jacuzzi inside, big kitchen, pool table. I would see how his family was together. He would always challenge his kids. He would always poke. He would say, you know what? Let me tell you, I had a conversation with a man. He's a Christian man. He would say, I had a conversation with a man today. I'm convinced Jesus was not God. And his kids would say, Dad, how can you say this? They would go on a three-hour debate. It was a beautiful thing. They said, you know what? I think we need to raise taxes. Dad, what are you talking? We have to raise taxes. <laughs> then the next day was, we have to lower taxes. He just wanted to see his kids debate. But the kids wanted to be around him. The grandkids wanted to be around him. So there was an image of somebody that if you one day work hard, you could one day have that life. But nobody in a million years would have guessed I'm going to be where I'm at today. Nobody. Wow. That's, that's honestly incredible. And I think as Australian Armenians, we look at you as a massive, I'm sure you get this every day, but a massive inspiration because there's a massive difference in, you know, dreaming and one day I'm going to do this, but then actually to do it is a whole different thing. And I think that those debates led you to have critical thinking and knowing how to get from point A to B. So that's amazing. We love debate. Debate is like the DNA of our family, of our podcast, of our company. <laughs> of course. If you work with me at any of the companies for lunchtime, this is what lunch would be like. We'd go to lunch for 90 minutes. And I would say, hey, did you see uh, what just happened with the presidential debate? What did you think about such and such as policy? Did you see what just happened with the flooding? Do you like the way they handled it? Did you see the trade that was made? Is that a good trade? But it's literally in the car with our kids in the back there debating. Anything and everywhere we go, we're debating. But having fun at the same time. Of course. But it's debate, a lot of debate. Wow, that's amazing. Well, honestly, um, yeah, I'm excited to hear more about everything once I would get through the questions. But I want to firstly introduce you properly to my channel. Welcome to my channel. So I pretty much started this accidentally in 2009. I was 19 at the time. And I began this ch channel solely to help bullying, you know, put a stop to bullying. So there was this girl, um, I don't know if you remember back in the day, you could reply to videos with another video mm -hmm, so this mm -hmm. girl was saying she was an influencer at the time you know i'm getting bullied i have all these hate comments and i responded to it with a b video on how to become beautiful so people clicked onto it thinking it's a makeup tutorial it's a you know fashion video how to do your hair and it was about how to treat people with integrity how to respect one another and just treat everyone with you know respect and love that went viral at the time so twenty thousand or forty thousand views 
and all these brands began contacting me and I was like, if I could help inspire one person mm -hmm. a day, I've done my job. So that's a little bit of a backstory on my channel and then Fashion Beauty Health. So grateful to have you on my channel. It's good to be on. Thank you. Great story. Thank you. Watching you, obviously, we, we understand that you have a very close bond with your family um, and that's something that some people may, may lack with. Now, what are some principles that you've been taught from your parents or your family, your sister, that's truly stuck with you in the long run? So my dad would tell me all the time, never be afraid of the truth. Well, he always tells a story where we went to a, uh, a sauna, a, a swimming pool sauna. It was like a high-end sauna in Iran where it was indoor swimming pool, mm -hmm. where you could order drinks and, you know, we go inside and, and I was a tall kid. So the, the guy says, well, uh, you have to be 13 years old to come in here. My dad says, he's 13. And I said, my dad's lying. I'm nine years old. My dad's like, this is not where you, this is where, you know, let us get this inside to have a good time. time. Patrick. But you know, it's funny. He tells that story. I said, what are you telling me? You told me to be honest. You told me to kind of uh, share my thoughts. That was a big one for my dad. Obviously, as you age, there's a difference between being honest 100% of the time. Sometimes when somebody asks you, how do you look? You don't say, you don't look good. You don't say, you look like you need to kind of cut down on the cheesecake or this. There's honesty and there's wisdom. I have learned to become wiser as I've aged. That's one thing for my dad. My dad was a very, very hard worker. My mother was very paranoid. So in business, you know, my uh, mom always being worried about who's getting close to you, friends, family, everybody. It's always be careful. So mom gave the paranoid uh, <laughs> lens. Dad gave the hard work lens and the honesty and just being straight up. And then those things worked out for business and in life. Yeah, and I think that's really great qualities to have. And I think it's good if you had that balance, you know? If it was on one side or the other side, it wouldn't be, you know, the way you They were today. definitely not on the same side, which was great. <laughs> I can say the same my thing. mom was a communist and my dad was an imperialist. Wow. They could not be in the same room. Let me tell you, they got divorced twice in 20 years. Twice. And remarried twice in 20 years. Yes. So I'm getting married. And I call my mom and I call my dad and I said, hey, just so you guys know, you guys are not coming to the wedding. <laughs> and my, uh, my dad is like, what are you talking about? I said, you're not coming to the wedding. And I said, mom, you're not coming to the wedding. Now my mom is an Armenian Armenian. Like imagine you telling your mom you're getting married. I would get murdered in uh, no, no question about it. Yeah. She's gonna get upset. But I said, you ain't coming to the wedding. wedding. She says, why not? I said, so let me get this straight. You and dad have not been in the same room since 1989. You want me to get married in 2009, and for the first time you guys see each other after 20 years is to be at my wedding? It's not gonna happen. I said, I have one way you can come to my wedding. You both have to come to my house, have dinner, I will step out, you guys hash it out, then you can come to the wedding. I'm not doing it. I totally get it. That's why you're not coming to the wedding. They said I'm not doing it. I'm not it. doing it. So they slept on it, a week went by. Uh, it's as if they talked to each other, which they didn't. Simultaneously, they called and they said, hey, okay, there's no way I'm gonna miss my son's wedding. I said, cool. So what time do you wanna come by? Let me check with the other side. It's as if I'm like the mediator getting no the two sides together. Finally, we did the dinner at the house and they come in. It is the most awkward moment <laughs> ever with the two of them in the room. And I said, okay, guys, this is about you. Me and Jennifer are gonna step out. You guys gotta talk. We step out within five minutes, they're both screaming, Patrick, we're good, we're done. You sure? We're done. Okay, come back. All right, we came back. And then there's this uh, famous picture taken on my wedding. Oh my God. The average person kind of looks at the wedding pictures and kind of goes through. Mm -hmm. So yeah, great pictures. We sit there and we say, if you only knew the story <laughs> behind my mom's face and they're both sitting on opposite side. So mom is on this side, dad is on this side. We're in the middle. I got the biggest smile on my face because I know the level of tension. Jesus. But uh, yeah, I mean, listen, our upbringing is a, everybody's got skeletons in the family. Some you know about, some we publicly advertise, some that stays with the family, some that's no one's business, but that kind of helps produce who you turn into. And all of that combined together, you know, allowed me to see the world the way I see today. A million percent. And now you have stories to tell your kids and like, if this happens, this is gonna happen. If I just say this, your mom says this, this is, you know, so you have like juice, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So as we mentioned earlier, my family and I grew up in Australia. Uh, we, we are a very close family. And I think uh, there's a few reasons why. We were like, there weren't any Armenians in Australia. So we all clung together. We didn't have much family. 
Um, and I noticed when we moved here, a lot of people, they were like, oh, okay, that's very interesting. Cause like they're not used to it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that's cool mm -hmm. that your brother follows when you. When did you guys move out here? We moved here, we all moved a separate time. So my sister, Sarah, she's becoming a doctor. She came here uh, right after she finished high school. And then my dad came, so she's not alone. And then I came once I finished my master's. Uh, and then Arlene came. My mom had to go back and sell the house. There's a rule in Australia you have to live in the house before you sell it for six months. Really? Yeah. Hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, recent. It's a recent sure. yeah, rule. So she came uh, about a year ago. So all different times. Uh, and every, people come up to me like, wow, you really are this close. It's not or, like just on your Instagram. I'm like, no. Like, what? Or like, oh, you guys are really this nice. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, seriously. And I think that's something that people like these days. But my question would be, What's your advice in bringing back that traditional close unit unity when it comes to family? Is it post? I mean, uh, yeah. it's a very wide question, but it, it is. On that? I mean, you got to realize my kids don't speak Armenian; they speak Spanish. Oh wow! They don't speak Assyrian, but they speak fluent Spanish. Our nanny was uncomfortable speaking to them in English. I said, "You can only speak to them in Spanish. That's all I want you to talk to them about." So, they've been raised knowing how to speak Spanish because that's all she talks to them about. Wow. Uh, my oldest son wants to learn Armenian. And we all always get people that send us and say, hey, I'll work with your son and I'll do this, I'll do that. If there's somebody local in South Florida, I would be more than happy to entertain it. My oldest two want to learn Armenian. The oldest wants to learn Armenian for a different reason. He says, I would love to speak Armenian so you and I can speak a language that nobody else speaks. Because I don't want the kids and mom <laughs> to know. That's the reason, right, exactly. So, you know, in regards to bringing those values and principles uh, uh, to the family, I, uh, uh, when I was getting married to my wife, my wife is uh, white from Texas. So she's a pure Texan. People see her for the first time. They speak, start speaking to an Armenian, a Syrian. I'm like, no, she's not Armenian. She's white. She's mm -hmm. from Texas. I had known her for five and a half years. We went on our first day, December 29th of 07. The next day, December 30th, is a Saturday, I believe, of 07. We went uh, you know, to Santa Monica to do the stairs. If you haven't done it yet, you got to go do it. It's a great spot. Then we went to Earth Cafe. You gotta go to Earth Cafe if you haven't been yet. It's insane. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Borders. You can't go to Borders, they're out of business. So don't try to find Borders in LA, it's closed <laughs> down. Yeah. And then we went to uh, uh, the bookstore and I bought her a book. I took her to church, but then I bought her this book called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged. So I said, listen, I've done this book and I've extra gone through the exercise with other people. You need to kind of go through this yourself, see what's important and let's sit down and mm -hmm. talk about it. A week later, we get to her place and we start going through it. I said, look, the house needs to smell like food, period. This is for me. You may think it's weird. For me, it needs to smell like food. <laughs> I said, when the house smells like food, kids will come home. Yeah. If it doesn't smell like food, kids will not come home. I said, two, you need to learn how to cook Middle Eastern food because I love Middle Eastern. If you don't, I, I said, I don't care if you're white, African-American, Hispanic, Asian. You have to know how to cook our family's food. And if you're offended by that, I'm not the guy for you. That's simple. So she says, okay. So we go on our next date. On our next date, she invites me to her place. And she cooks a, a Syrian dish, which, wow. by the way, was horrible. It was not the best dish I've had in my life. This is the part about telling the truth, which, you know, I get wrong she sometimes. Tried her best. But what I told her was, today, she's my favorite cook. When she cooks, I mean, I can't wait to eat her food. But at the time, what I valued is the fact that she understood what meant to me, important to me, because marriage will be the hardest thing you'll ever do. Marriage is not easy. Raising kids, very hard, but marriage is harder. You will be more forgiven with your kids than you will be with your spouse because your kids are yours. Your husband's mm. not yours. Mm. You can't replace kids. In the mindset, you can say, well, this doesn't work out. But those two will be very, very difficult, marriage and kids. So the more things you get up front, I mean, if you look at the biggest decisions we make in life, marriage at the top, having kids, buying a house, starting a business. You can go on with all places you put your kids to school, who you befriend, all mm -hmm. of these things. Uh, you can't get those big decisions wrong. You can get 19 speeding tickets, fine. It's bad, you shouldn't do it. I got 21 of them. My license has been suspended a couple times. If you can avoid driving fast, do it. She shouldn't do it. But it's not the biggest mistake in life, right? Biggest decision in life. You can go out there and have Jobs in different industries, you, you know, what you wear. Some people have good taste, some people don't have good taste. Mm -hmm. You look at somebody and you're like, wow, I can't believe he's wearing that. I can't believe she's wearing that. And sometimes you look at somebody and you're like, wow, I can't believe she's wearing that. Mm -hmm. looks great on her. But that's great for impression, but it's not one of the biggest decisions in life. So for me, it's, it's more about, you know, sitting down and trying to instill the values and principles in our house. 
Reading books is extremely critical. If you want anything, you want to negotiate with me, it's all about books. You got to read 30 pages a day the moment you turn six. It's six is 20, eight is 30. So our daughter, Senna, she knows every day is 20 pages, including Sundays, Mondays, Saturdays, vacation, Christmas, doesn't matter. You have to move your body every day where you have to go out there and exercise. In a family right now, we're taking a diet very seriously with health. So we're changing a lot. We just brought somebody in to go through the fridge and just kind of look at what we're doing, what we're not doing. So we're kind of changing that up. But again, lead, respect, improve, love. Those are four things. Mm -hmm. Never bully, never get bullied. We pray for four things. Courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. And our affirmation, I, Dylan James Bed David, will one day be a great leader. Not I am a great leader, I will one day be a great leader, because you're lying if you say you're a great leader. Yeah. Becoming a great leader takes a few decades to 100%. go through. It doesn't happen overnight. By the way, when you sit down and you map that out for your life and your family, and then you sell it, mm. and you hope enough of them buy, this is why I got four kids and not one kid. I think having one kid is the biggest risk you'll take. <laughs> uh, if I could have 20 kids, I would have 20 kids. Yeah. But my wife's having the kids, I'm not. <laughs> So we stopped at four. But I mean, I can go on and on and on. A lot of this is thought out. And when you put it on paper, then your job as a leader is to keep reselling it, re-talking about it, re-presenting a different story that, you know, validates one of the points you're making and, and you're hoping enough of it sticks with them. 100%. My mom has always told us growing up, you guys, the three kids, you're a mirror of us. Whether you do good, you bad, you humiliate yourself, that's fine. But you're humiliating at your family. So we, we grew up with the mentality, whatever we do, that's our legendary success is my Armenian success. Yeah. guilt. Yes. The Armenian yeah. method, man, of leading. We all do it. This, uh, you don't, know, don't shame our family. Yeah, it's such, yeah. A, it's such a pride, you know, thing that Armenians we have, the Syrians we have. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, by the way, it's not everybody. No. It's no. a different kind of a pressure that I is know. set from the top, you know. Some like it, some don't like it. I like high standards. So, you know, sometimes when you set a high standard like that, it oh, doesn't mean your kids are going to like it all the time. Let me say one thing. When we were young, I hated it. My mom was, both my parents, but more my mom, very strict, very strict. Like, I didn't want to do something. No, you're going to do it. When you when you turn a certain age and then what, don't what, argue. When is me. your mom's birthday? What month? January 20th. Oh, so I always get it April wrong. April 20th. No, so no, you're no. in Aries. No, February, February. February 20. Uh, Aquarius. But they told me it's 21. I don't know. I still am Aquarius. Yeah, so my right. wife is February 14th. I have not met an Aquarius I haven't liked in my life yet. Very so they're strict, very, right? very good people. No, very I'm cool. Very so high standards. Great. Very. And I'm, I'm very grateful. How did he do with the standards? Oh, he's, he's amazing. Yeah, you he's, can he's, tell he's like, he, his, heart, his eyes seem like he's a very good guy. He's, a, he's an amazing okay. person. I'm yeah, you can, you can I'm feel good. his spirit. I don't know about your Puerto Rican son. I'm a little concerned about him. <laughs> Or the German one, but I get a very good feeling about. No, like my, I'm, I'm. I... By the way, just for full disclosure, if you follow this, she does not have a Puerto Rican son. No, we don't want rumors circulating <laughs> here, breaking the up Armenian our marriage. Uh, Pat said, no. yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very. I think I've hit the jackpot when it comes to family. Touch wood, and I think they inspire me every day. They're younger than me, but I, I look up to them so much. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do this without them. Respect. Yeah, I it's great. Yeah, it's great. It's, yeah, they're amazing. So actually, one of my other question was about family. So being a content creator for 15 years now, my it's a family business. My dad does all the filming on YouTube, Instagram, everything. It's so funny. I tell people he's like a 65-year-old Armenian guy, and you'll, you'll hear us yelling on the street, and people are like, what are they yelling about? You know what we're yelling about? He's like, I want to take a photo in front of this tree. I'm like, Dad, I don't like this tree. No, yeah, it's this tree. And he goes down. No, take it. Take. I'm like, Dad, Is he we... a very big creative? Is he a creative guy? He's a guy? musician. Okay, I mean, there you go. So we yeah. fight over trees all day. I'm like, Dad, like, I don't want, you're embarrassing. I'm going to walk away. Yeah. And we'll literally fight over things like that. But um, my mom's my manager. She helps me day to day. My brother, I have an agency with a marketing agency called Tomasian Media Marketing. So it's a family business. So my question is, do you have family involved? Because I know it can be tricky. And how much of your success would you contribute to your family? Because I know your sister works with you. I, I love working with family. Capable family. Yeah. But I love working with family. It, just because you're family doesn't mean we're going to be working together. Oh, so the way I set the standards with the kids, uh, we're driving the other day and I ask them, I say, hey, uh, Tico, Dylan, Senna, are you guys going to want to be in business with me when you guys age? He says, that, that, that's a pretty technical question. Let us think <laughs> about it. I look at Jen, I'm like, what? You're 10 years old, you're nine years old. And they what start talking. What do you have talking. to think about, yeah. So for 10 minutes, they're talking. They said, 
Yeah, we made a decision that we're probably going to be in business with ourselves, not with you, but we're going to do a business together. I'm like, fair enough. I'm like, that's fantastic, right? Because uh, my vision with these guys is to figure out a way for them to do business together. But at the same time, each of them has their own independent mind. Yeah. You know, you don't know what they're going to be doing. They have their own goals. They have their own visions. Mm -hmm. They have what they're going to be doing. My ideal situation would be for all of us to live in a similar neighborhood. There's a family in our community, a very successful billionaire family in, the, in, in, in an industry that does very well. The oldest son, who's the CEO of the company, has the house here, beautiful home. The youngest son is here. Parents are here. Both sons have four kids. Both sons are doctors. Both sons married a doctor. And their family is always together. They were living on the same street 10 years ago, two years ago. Now they're living right next to each other, and they're very, very close because of certain values and principles. Mm -hmm. They went through a uh, certain uh, estate planning company called Ronald Blue. I don't know if you've heard of it. They do a very good job. I think they manage a very small amount of families, mm -hmm. uh, one of them being the Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. And oh, wow. so the structure of the way you build it with your family when you do estate planning is, hey, in this family, if you want to get to this, you got to go through these certain expectations. If you don't, you don't have to do it but you're not gonna be participating in XYZ. There's a certain set of standards that you gotta go through with the family. You can go do whatever you wanna do, but these are some of the guidelines that the family has. They expect you to do this, 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 that, right? Somebody may listen to this and say, oh my God, this is too much, this is ridiculous. No wonder, you know, Harry married Megan and everybody is bothering these guys. That's yeah. exactly why, you know, et cetera. No, 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 this is ours. Never said you have to like it, but this is ours. I selfishly, I'm greedy, I would like my kids to be around me for the rest of my life, because I love kids. I would want my grandkids to be close to me because we have certain visions with our family, what we want to do the next 40 years, right? So to inject those mindsets into the kids require them to be close. Now, again, they can do whatever they want to do, but that's part of what we think about. So my sister's been in business with me for uh, I don't know how long now, 12 years. And uh, originally we tried to be in business together at 23. It wouldn't have worked out because I was a different guy. Your age. And it, it, I was- uh, Your age, your, your yeah, different mentality. Yeah, no, it wouldn't have worked yeah. out at that age where I was at. So yes, ideally the answer is yes, but for the right relatives, the right family members and the right, uh, because sometimes a leader of a company. So I, I went to this one uh, seminar uh, 13 years ago on how to deal with crucial conversations. And we bring them all the time to, spend time with our executives. I think people need to take this course, fantastic. The book is fantastic. And while I'm at this course, there's 30 of us. Five of them is one family. It's a mother with four kids. Her husband died. The $30 million a year business is left to the family and she's in charge. Let me tell you, for two days, you learn so much from watching their, them fight against each other, okay? Mm -hmm. So every dynamic is different. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're the leader in this, in one family, and it's not him. Maybe it's him, not you. Maybe it's her. Maybe it's every family's in a different way. So one dynamic doesn't apply to every other family. 100%. But uh, for the most part, I've seen, uh, I just had a conversation right now with somebody, very powerful person in the office politically. We had a two hour lunch together and we were talking about one of the candidates, how big of a role the spouse plays in this one candidate and how this candidate made multiple bad decisions that ruined their political career because they listened to the wrong person. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's also listening to the wrong mom, the wrong dad, the wrong husband, the wrong wife, the wrong sibling. So no two situations are the same. You have to be where, very, very aware, intuitive, patient, strategic, forgiving. But if the vision is big, you can't be winging that part, especially with family. Because family is going to use guilt and family is going to use you know, well, it's not fair, you should do this for your sister, you should do that for your brother, you should do that, I'm your dad, I'm your mom, I'm your this, I'm your dad. And I have, I have a lot of respect for that, but sometimes that prevents the person from going and doing something big. My family, uh, till today, I don't have a four-year degree, okay? I was always compared to the guys that had all the four-year, hey, you're gonna be, a, what, what are the three things? Engineer, what is it? Lawyer, doctor, doctor. right? Armenian, those yeah. are the three things. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely not an engineer, although some of the things I do has to do with that mindset. Not a doctor, not a lawyer. I took a completely different route. And if I would have been like micromanaging Hubbard like this, it would have never worked out. My dad was very much of a- Do you think? He was a, here's what I expect from you. Strong values, strong character, hard work, leading, save your money and don't tell anybody you have money. There's gotta be amount of money that no one knows about, including your wife, including me, nobody. 
but go become a leader mm -hmm. versus, well, you know, you don't have a four-year degree. You don't have this. You don't have that. So sometimes that structure doesn't allow for one to really spread their wings and go above and beyond than what you did. I want my kids to do something bigger than I did. So to do that, it's, it's not easy. It's very technical. It's very uh, complicated. But again, I don't want to get too deep into this topic. It is something I think about a lot. Yeah, no, of course. And I think that's something that, like, there's a fine line between, you know, everything that you listed, the values and everything, and, you know, trust and you know, respecting your family, but having trust in yourself. So, for example, I, I finished my master's and I sat my mom down and I was like, mom, I'm going to become a YouTuber. She was like, absolutely, no, you're not. And I was like, listen, trust me. So we came up with this plan. She's like, if in a year you make a certain amount of money and you, you don't have to rely on us, then fine, I'll, I'll help you. Yeah. So now she travels with me, she helps me, obviously. Yeah. But at the time, I was like, why does she have to be so difficult? Australian parents wouldn't do this. Oh, I hate this. But when I look back now, I'm like, okay, you know, that she had a certain set of values. I, list, I listened to her and it, it, I went with my gut and this happened. Most Armenian moms wouldn't do that. Never. Approach. Are you, you kidding me now? You would no. have had in a very different kind of situation. I'm, I feel like I'm still like the black sheep. Yeah. And I feel like she's still kind of low key price for us. You know what it is, though? Here's how this thing works. Okay. So uh, I'm talking to a guy two days ago, mm -hmm. and he says to me, he says, does your wife let you do what you want to do? As many companies as you're running. You know what I told the guy? Mm. I said, I don't even understand the question. Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He says, does your wife let you do what you want to do with the amount of traveling business companies? That's the context we're talking mm -hmm. about, not doing whatever you mm -hmm. want to do. Yeah. In the context of working, yeah. late, all this stuff. I said, I look at my wife, my wife is standing next to me. She says, I don't think we've ever had that conversation. She says, because Pat's the leader of the household and he leads us, okay? So now, some people and men want that kind of a respect from their wives without delivering. Mm -hmm. You can't have that. That's the uh, difference. It, it's almost yeah. like the unspoken truth where it's the unspoken standard, okay? In every family, there is that one relative that everybody knows. When she speaks, everybody listens. Or when he speaks, everybody listens, right? You call that the leader or the EF Hutton of the family. That doesn't happen through force. That's earned. Now, in every family, there's also somebody that thinks they're that person. But no one listens. They're to the most annoying person. Yeah. And they're driven by envy and all this other stuff. Your mom is sitting here proud just, about you know what her daughter is doing. Yeah. Okay. And that is not very common. So, Arax, salute to you. Respect for what you've done with your kids. Truly. This has got to be a dream sitting there seeing what she's doing, what your son is and what your you know, family you raise is doing. It's a dream for any parent. Yeah, that means a lot. To, she's definitely the, the leader. She's when she moved here, everyone came to her. She, I'm like, you're like the president. Five a.m. She's us getting calls. Yeah, mom, I'll do this to her, um, three other sisters. I'll help you with this aspect. And I'm like, wow, it looks tiring, but you, it, you don't just become the leader. It takes effort and Moral a certain authority. place. Yeah, a hundred percent. So this, I, my family and I talk about this often. So a few days ago, you posted a video on. Um, on how that one friend that you saw would always have your back or that one cousin, and Arlen shared that with me twice in a day, um, or that one cousin that you think has always have, you know, had your back or will have your back in a, a split second. Once you're, you know, have a bit of a crisis, they find success in that, like they find happiness in that. So I know it's a bit of a controversial question, but my question is like, how would you handle that? You can't, are you, being I mean, you can't cut off certain family members or you know what I mean? Or like, you know, how do you deal with things like that if you feel like they're just waiting for the pin to drop? What level of family though? What, what, is this sibling? No, is this, no, no. Is this cousins or is this like a... Uh... Not direct, mom, dad, siblings. You're we not can, talking that. You're no, talking. No, 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 no. Outside, definitely listen, outside. Listen, you know it's it's funny you say this, and I will tell you this very comfortably. My parents mm -hmm. uh, got a divorce. On both sides, they would say he's a Borosian. My mother's a Borosian. Mm -hmm. He's a Borosian. Borosian ila aramnaila surai lela. He's an Armenian. He's a Borosian. He's not a Syrian. The other side would say, esi betavida, esi asori, esi papi terena, esi mami terenci, esi papi terena. Tesi nchkana ira papi hamaranum. Like, hey, this is a father son, not a you know. Yeah. And one day, and here's a funny thing. I, I loved all these guys, but I couldn't stand the games they were playing. I told them one day, I said, listen, there's only three people that matter in my life at the highest level. It's my mom, my dad, and my sister. You guys are all secondary. The only reason I have a relationship with you is because of them. Not because I want to play the political game and come around you and you talk shit behind my back. I have no, no time for that. I don't want to do that. 
I was, I was a very young kid when I said that to both sides. So wow. both sides of my family, this is not tradi- I'm not. By the way, I'm not recommending you do this because your mom's <laughs> probably like losing her mind right now saying that's not good advice. But I'm telling you right now for yeah. me, I would much rather be like this with family that's blood, 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 mom, dad, siblings, than be like this, but then be like this, whatever. I, I, this is what, it, I'm 44 years old today. What I value today is very different than what I value 10 years ago. Who my enemies are today are different than who my enemies were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, et cetera, et cetera, right? I bought a car. The car I bought is because I like speed and I like to fit in a sports car. I've got a car sitting in the house. It's a very expensive car. I don't fit in it. My wife never wants to go on a date, so it's just been parked there. We've driven it 10 times in the last 12 months. It does nothing for Mm -hmm. me, right? So we bought a car I fit. My kids Mm -hmm. like it. It goes nice, fast, speed, convertible. It's a beautiful car that I like, it's good. It's actually asking a question, what do you like? Rather than, what are they gonna think? What is this, this is what I like. I like to live in a community, hardcore security at the front, armed, this is what I, only one way to get in, this is what I like. I like to raise my kids this way, I like my marriage to be this way, I like this to be this way. I never told you you have to agree with me, I never told you if it's this is the way to do it or not. But I chose to lead a long time ago, this is what I'm doing with my own agenda, right? So for you, if somebody doesn't support your dreams in their blood, they're not family, they're just blood. To me, I got friends uh, who I'm in business with for the last 18 years who support mm. what I do and they're more supportive than many of the blood relatives that I have. Uh, value changes as you age. You know, I, I would much rather have somebody's 100% support that is not the same last name as me than have 10% of somebody's support that's the same last name as me. Uh, priorities have changed a lot. Yeah, and I think that only gets better with age, of course, and experience. But yeah, that's something that we have to, um, you know, hold on to and learn. It's, it's not, not easy, it's but it's, it's not very easy. hard. It's, but, yeah, it's very course. hard because you got memories with these people. It's 100%. not like you don't have memories with, and it's not like we're cold-blooded, you know, robots to say I don't want to talk to you anymore. No, you got hard, you got emotion, yeah, you got history. 100%. But you know, you you are, you're either with me or you're not, and I'm totally okay with that. That's a great answer. We'll keep that. Yeah. For the long run. Um, so you're, you mentioned in your book, which I'm a big fan of, that uh, you used to go to Vegas 26 times a year. Yep. And then you sat your friends down and you're like, don't invite me. I would love to know how that conversation went. Do you have a relationship with these friends? Some of them I do. Some of them, they would say the line and saying, Pat, you're no longer who you used to be. You know, you've would, changed. You've changed and all this other stuff. And I used to be offended by that until I realized what that meant. That means I'm growing. 100%. And I don't mind that. That's a compliment now. But yeah, I mean, the reason why I don't blame them for thinking the way they, they did is because it was so dramatic mm. of a change. It wasn't like a gradual change I made. One day I'm like, don't call me. I'm not going to the club. What are you talking about? I'm telling you, I'm not going to the club. Don't call me. Tell them my girl, don't come over anymore. Yeah, right. I'm telling you, don't come over anymore. Birthday suit, don't come over anymore. We're done. I'm playing my vision. I'm going to go do what I want to do. Again, listen, this doesn't make sense to the average person because I'm a man and I have temptations and I'm attracted to women and I'm attracted to fun. And these clubs, I was very good at the clubs. I was very good at going to the nightclubs. You would have had a blast with me if we went to a party together. I was that guy. Mm -hmm. But one day I'm like, I don't like the trajectory of where my life is going. I'm not going to do this because... I sat there and I'm looking at my dad and is, uh, uh, you know, has, having a heart attack. I'm like, this guy's going to die because you're bullshitting around here. And if he dies for the rest of your life, you're going to hang on to that. And you're going to create resentment with your kids. And you're going to blame other people versus get your act together. Go do something big with your life. And then you can do whatever kind of parties you want to do with people that are at your level as eagles. And then those conversations are going to be fun. Those parties are going to be fun. And you're going to host them with the most interesting people coming to your place. Why don't you do that? So... The more I sold myself that idea, I bought it, and then it was not easy for the first six months, 12 months, 18 months, and then everybody stopped calling. And once they stopped calling, it's a lot easier. And trust me, they stopped calling. But like, good for them, because like, look where you are now, you know what I mean? And by the way, I love these guys. I mean, there's uh, one guy I worked with at uh, uh, Burger King for God knows how long, and we, he was a cashier. I was a guy making, you know, Whopper no onions. That's kind of what I would make. I was the chef in the back with a medium shirt, and, you know, friends would always come and say, how come they don't have an extra large shirt your size? <laughs> but I have phenomenal memories with these guys. This is part of life. Mm-hmm. But the moment you get clear on a vision that's real... There's no holding back. You, 
it's it's a very it's very different when it's real when it's real it's very different and you're gonna know when it's real you're gonna know when it produces a certain emotion mm -hmm. you can't describe it most people won't buy it most people will think you're full of shit but everybody will know it 20 years later 100%. and that's what's happened I, I truly think uh, it's taken me a while to get to this mentality but I, I truly think that some people come into your life for a certain chapter you learn amazing things from them you grow in that chapter mm -hmm. like I need a certain people in yeah. primary school and then they go off and I, I used to look at that as a bad thing but I'm like you know what that's a good thing I, I feel blessed that I've known those people and it's been an amazing journey but like times change your chapter change your goals change so that's completely understandable. Something that we resonated with you a lot as a family was your do it now mentality and everything has to have a sense of urgency, which for the love of God has been instilled in us since day one. Um, I would love to know who instilled this mentality in you. It's just not even a question. It's my dad. Mm. Yeah, the, the most annoying thing with my dad is when he says he's going to do something for you. There's no holding. It's done. He's doing it for you. The part that's annoying is he expects the same standards from you. <laughs> yeah. If you tell him, I'm going to call Social Security. I'm going to call the building. I'm going to call your car. I'm going to get the car. I'm going to go bring this. I'm going to go bring that permit. If you forget, and by the way, here's what's crazy about it. Anybody that works with me that has ever made a promise to my dad, you ask 200 people, they'll all say the same thing. Man, one time I forgot to do this for your dad. I, every time I never hear the end of it. So a part of it is, you know, speed gives you an edge. There's a, you know, uh, 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 momentum is every great performer's best friend. Mass times velocity, you know, equals momentum. Mass, how many calls you make in what speed. 200 calls in one day produces different results than 200 calls in a week versus 200 calls in a month. It's the same number of uh, calls, but it's the velocity and when you do it, right? So when I was first building my YouTube channel, you flew out here to come to this interview. I'm running a company, I'm having kids, and I'm going to New York, and I'm doing three interviews. I'm sitting with Bernard Carrick, then comes Scaramucci, then comes General McChrystal, then comes Ariana Huffington, then comes, I'm doing all these interviews back to back to back. So imagine one day you're doing four interviews. I got four set of notes. I have to ask the questions, I have to eat, I gotta get my brain, and I'm doing conference calls, negotiations, issues. We lost an employee, we lost a client. All the, and I'm going through it. But then all of a sudden, they're like, well, if you guys are not going to come to Dallas, because Dallas is not a market that everybody goes to. Dallas is not like where influencers mm -hmm. live in Dallas, right? Yeah. It's L.A., Miami, New York, Chicago, certain markets, mm -hmm. right? It's not really Dallas. So I said, you know, we're going to go out there and do it. So that was a way of accelerating the speed. You can't come to us, we'll come to you. So we would book multiple back to back to back to back to back. And then when you get to a certain point that you're getting eyeballs, then everybody will come to you. But speed is a secret sauce, and most people don't uh, don't move that quickly. You know, I'm, I'm, yesterday I'm being interviewed by uh, uh, Mayor Suarez, Mayor of Miami. Okay, it's yesterday or, or Saturday. I think it's Saturday. Yeah. Could have been Friday. I'm with him. I'm driving three weeks ago, and this is the Mayor of Miami, good-looking guy. He looks like he should have been a model, but he decided to be a mayor <laughs> because his dad was a mayor. Very good-looking guy, right? So he messaged me, hey, PBD, I watch all your content. When can I get you in City Hall? I'd love to interview on my podcast. So I'm like, no problem. Have your assistant call my assistant. Great. We're driving, coming back. My assistant's sitting in the back. Literally 30 seconds later, his assistant, Rosie, calls my assistant. And she says, hang on, Pat, I'm getting a call. Yes, this is Karina. Yeah, this is, oh, Mayor Suarez. Yes. She's like, what? 30 seconds. So imagine this. He's the mayor of Miami, okay? Yeah. He's doing what he's doing with a big budget that he has for City Like, that he's turned it around. It's 1.3% unemployment, done a great job, right? Look how quickly he moved on a Friday. Most mayors on Friday are golfing, kicking it, relaxing. On Monday. That's the point. So for me, <laughs> the level of speed of how somebody works like that tells me this guy's up to something nobody knows about. Because a typical person who's entitled, they don't move that quickly. But anybody that competes at the highest level, yeah, you know, like you go, what's the rule? If I get a, if you get a girl's number, how many days later should you call her? Three. Three days, right? That's the rule. That's the rule of thumb, right? It's written every, in the Quran, in the Bible, in every business book, it's three <laughs> days, right? You cannot call her for three days. Yeah. But imagine the guy calls you. Hey, listen, couldn't wait. I want to talk to you. I kind of like to get straight to the point. How are you going to handle that? You're going to be like, This is what? different. Are you okay? So listen, we can do two things. So if you want me to play the game, 
and call you in three days. I can hang up, assume I never called you, and I'll call you in three days. Or we can talk right now. Which would you prefer? I can play games. I'd much rather not. Yeah, of course. The girl says what? What? Who talks like this? These are the types of people that somehow, someway, all of a sudden, because they don't want to play by the rules that everybody else plays. They, 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 they're wired in a different way, and they understand that part. So, yeah, that's what I mean by Mayor Suarez was kind of like, let's go. A lot of guys at his level are like that. And I think that's why he's successful. And I think there's a very uh, distinctive way that relationships, friendships, business, it's going to make you stand out. It's so funny. I don't know if you remember, we DM'd and then you're, you're like, email my uh, sister. I emailed the Ireland, like, book the flight, book the flight, book the flight. I'm like, Ireland, we don't even know what's happening. That's but, good. So you're like that. Yeah, both of them are like right, that. I'm, I'm more like, okay, let's see, let's wait. It's yeah. holiday, he's busy. That's but that's busy. good. That's also great partnership. It's also beneficial to have somebody like that in the life to kind of give that perspective, right. which is like, let's take a day to make a decision. Sometimes the bigger decisions are like that. But uh, the urgency part of people that get things up, by the way, when I do, you know why I do that when I say email this person? It's a way of not having to do another podcast. But if you do it and you follow through and, yes. and you get through my filtering system, I do four speaking gigs per year, not because I only get four speaking gigs per year. We get hundreds per year. I don't want to do speaking gigs. Mm. If I travel to a place and they pay me $200,000 to speak for an hour, I lost a full day of travel time. I can make that value in the company. I don't need to go to a place to speak, right? But if people do the proper follow-up, then we say, listen, wow. respect to this person. Oh, yeah, because I remember being small. I remember when I was at your level. I remember I'm like, yeah, if these people are working like this, salute, go get them. Wow, the marketplace wants people like you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that made my day. So I kind of piggybacking on what you said. As a powerful manifester, you know, when you were young, you suggested certain goals and everything. So I, I like to, there's like three things that I keep in mind. Working hard. It's not just like I want to one day, no, work hard for it. Visualize and have faith in God. That's my perspective. So, and, and that's what I think takes me from point A to B. Now, you're already achieving so much, but I want to know, do you manifest? Do you believe in that? Are you a visualization type of guy? Yes. I'm about faith and fate. I think, you know, certain people are destined to do something big and mm -hmm. typically those people believe that and I know to some people it's a crock of, you know what, I don't. I believe in fate and I believe in faith. You know, stories in your life kind of cause you to be thinking about life in a completely different way. I don't know if life is worth risking that God does not exist. Let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because the risk of God doesn't exist, if you're right, cope. If you're wrong, you're screwed, okay? But if you live life believing God exists, and if you're wrong, you live the better life. 100%. And if you're right, hell yeah, let's go play backgammon and, you know, in the clouds with God and meet some old relatives that we haven't <laughs> seen for a while. So, so I, I, I'm, I, I can't see myself. This conversation came about, we're having a couple conversations with some guys around me that are single, good looking, and love to party, and they're very good with, the, with ladies. And I said, okay, so let me ask you a question. What record do you want to break? What do you want to do? Do you want to break the record of a guy that's been with the most girls? Tell me what that record means. Who cares? What is that record? Amongst your peers? Amongst us? Fine. No problem. But in life, there's only the things that are really worth giving your energy to, like all your energy to, are generally into people, into knowledge, into your kids, into family, into your heritage, into certain values and principles as freedom and all that. Everything else is secondary to it. Why give life to things that are temporary stuff? And by the way, again, remember, we're all, you know, tempted. We're all flawed. We all have issues. We all are trying to work with our inner insecurities and whatever anxieties people might have that self-inflicted. None of us walk around with a perfect life. We all have issues. Some of us are able to cover it up very good and seem very tough, but deep down inside, we got fears. And some of us are just more open about it and we need to be a little bit more concealed mm -hmm. to not allow the enemy to know all your different insecurities and fears that you have. Sometimes people give their business to people too much and you gotta kind of slow it down a little bit. Not everybody needs to know your business. Mm -hmm. That's your business. But once you kind of sit back and you realize what things matter the most, then who do you need? Raising kids, you ain't gonna be around your kids all the time. You're gonna need to have some faith, you know, you're gonna go through hard times. The more you age, people are gonna die. It's just a matter of time. It's just gonna happen. Yeah. Uh, friends, relatives, family, you're naive to think it's not gonna happen and it's gonna hurt a lot. So who are you gonna lean on? Just friends and family? Who are you gonna lean on when you're driving in a car by yourself and you need somebody to talk to? You're gonna constantly call everybody? No. I think faith plays a very important role 
fate plays a very important role when you're really putting your time into it. You feel like there's a need for your level of urgency and leadership. So I think those two are very, very big part of my life in a big way. I read a book one time, David and Goliath. He said, you know, people who had a close call with death, you know, they're wired in a way to think they're destined to do something big. And if you've lived in Iran, what year, Alex, what, what year did you guys leave? What year did you leave? 1984. 84, so you, were, so you were there for the beginning of the war, right? Iran, Saddam Hussein, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you live there in Iran and we're getting bombed on, it ain't the prettiest, yeah. you know, experience. So, but in, at the same time, that can give that individual a certain lens that other people are not going to get if you're able to channel that energy in the right way. The same thing can happen to two different people. One person can say, I'm a victim. The other person can say, mm. man, I think, I think God put me here to do something big. You get to pick and choose on how you view that issue. 100%. And I think people don't understand that. It's such a cliche to say, and I think that's why people, it goes over their head, but we're here for such a short time period. It's a joke. You know, people, my dad says, like, life is like a train that's going, people just falling off. Like, last week, so many of his friends just passed away. Like, it's, and I'm like, wow. His, and, his friends. Yeah, his friends. Like, heart attack, this, that. And I'm like, wow, like, it's, it's crazy to think. But I like to play this, like, little mindset trick and it's not the best i don't really suggest people do this but i like to think like if i'm having a tough time i'm like hey i'm i'm not i can't complain i prayed for this like i prayed for god to give me such a busy life i have a breakdown once a day <laughs> i'm living that life which i love very grateful but also i always say if i'm like you know overwhelmed or whatever like just stressed about something like dumb compared to the you know major things i'm like okay i'm gonna pretend god forbid it's my funeral today right people are crying whatever that's it my life's done and then what and I'm like, no, I have a chance to go back. And I'm like, you know, like 17 again, or one of those movies, the, mm -hmm. the fifth year old gets like a, becomes a child again. I'm like, I can do this all over. I can mm. literally do whatever I want. None of these people, is their opinion is going to matter, you know? And I think that definitely changes everything that goes on into my brain. And sometimes um, we have this saying in, in uh, Armenian, we say, tete vertu, because I'm very like, oh my God. And I, How do you say that in English? How do you translate them? You can't take really, it lightly? but like, take it lightly. Take it easier. Yeah. Take, take don't it don't take it to your heart. Yeah. That's how I yeah. kind of take it. And that's helped me so much. It's like such yeah. a, not a silly, but it's like such a normal saying. Moving on to my next question. Like, I think a few things in uh, life change your brain ke chemistry, right? Like becoming a father, I'm sure, losing someone, traumatic events. Like I lost my uncle uh, 20 years ago now. He was 31 at the time. But that's completely altered the way my brain like says bye to people. If you're leaving and you come to my house, I have to say bye to you for 10 minutes. Like, are you, go are you okay? Are you healthy? Do you need anything? Mm. I love you. I love you. I like, you know. So besides becoming a father and, you know, I I'm sure escaping the Iranian revolution, what's been something that's changed your brain chemistry? What do you call it when uh, from 10 to 14, what age is that called for, for boys? Like it, your, what do you call that? Uh, it's not teenager, right? What do you call that? Is it preteen? Would you call that preteen? Yeah, preteen, 10 or 14. Yeah. I, I haven't had a preteen, so I don't know what it is to be 10 or 14. When my parents uh, uh, got a divorce and we went to Germany at a refugee camp, I was the I was the leader of the household at 10 years old. So the paranoia when men would come over and I got a sister and a mother, that paranoia was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen uh, a few things that when men would try to do what they did in Germany, it really gave me a very natural, you know, it was immediate. Mm. And it wasn't like somebody said, hey, protect your sister and your mom. No. It, man, the way we've been created, that that wiring is bam, right there. A 10-year-old becomes 25 like this to protect mom and uh, uh, sister. So Germany being in that uh, refugee camp, phenomenal experience. Not necessarily the best experience, mm. but it was a phenomenal experience in character building. Military was the same as well. I would say a couple of those things. Starting companies, I got to tell you. You know, there is a certain phenomenon about starting a company, the craziness of a startup. You're running 24-7. Your savings on the line. You're running out of savings. You're trying to recruit. You're losing customers. You're losing partners. You're doing all this stuff. And I'm not trying to give it a horror story. I would do it all over again. I love running businesses. Oh, my God. People like playing video games. I love building companies. I mean, there's something very exciting about building a company. I agree. And if you've been in it and you've been part of a startup that high, it's a very different kind of a high because it's not a nine to five environment. It's a go, go, go. It's not for everybody. We just hired a new CFO for the media company and I'm interviewing him and I'm talking to him. I said, you ever work with a founder? Um, yes. The other people I spoke to, I said, you ever work with a founder? No, but I've worked with large corporations before. I said, it's not the same. 
sometimes a job at a lar large corporation is a lot more kickback than a small corporation that's a startup. It's not about how big the company is. The startup energy is very chaotic, speed, fast, let's go. You can't say things like, yeah, I'll call you on Monday and it's Saturday morning. No, no, hey. So it's not for everyone. So I would say probably refugee camp, I would say mom and sister were, you know, 10 or 14 had to grow up quickly. Uh, military and running startups, I would say those three. Now running, I mean, I'm, you, I'm sure you live a chaotic life, um, you know, and it's something that very few people can do. The, the more you become successful, the more energy you have to output, obviously. Now, I want to know what goes on in your day, what goes on in your brain? How do you ignore the white noise, eliminate yeah. that and be like, this is what we're going to do? I mean, first of all, so, so the moment you create content, you have to know. Like, I used to like the YouTube days where it was thumbs up and thumbs down. You know yeah, when you could say, oh, we got 93% on this. Why? We got 98 on the last one. Oh, we got 89% on this. Let me read the comments. What do we do here? Oh, got it. Okay, fair enough. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. Today, it's kind of a little bit that they just want you to see the thumbs up. I'm not a fan of it. I like yeah. to see exactly what's going on with the thumbs down. Um, but, uh, you, you know, to, to, to go back to your question on how you handle the chaos and all of it, uh, we had a guy that called me out yesterday on a, a YouTube live. I said, well, Patrick this and Patrick that and Patrick this. So I get to send this video all the time. I'm like, what do you want me to do with this video? Tell me how you want me to handle this video. I got nothing to do with this video. It literally does nothing to me when that's happening. Nothing to me. I look at it as a form of bullying. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. So let's just say, you know, you're in high school. You're a great basketball player. You're the best high school player in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, that you have on your, in your school. And you go and play junior high school kids, and they talk shit to you, and you beat them. And then what? What do you call that? That's bullying. Mm -hmm. You feel good about it? He didn't do anything about it. So what if this eighth grader says, you're a loser, you're an idiot, you're this. You're like, okay, he's eighth grade, you're a senior. What, like, why even entertain that thought, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're a high school, best high school player, and you go play with college basketball players, like, oh my God, I suck. I got work to do, and that guy just scored. I mean, he did this. So I like to compete this way. I don't like to compete this way. This to me is bullying. You have to know that this is who's gonna do a lot of the talking. But the day you're lucky, and this does the talking to you, you know what they're telling you? You're about to be here next. I don't know if you oh, understood what I just said yeah, right there. Yeah. It's the most incredible feeling where you say, wait, who said what about us? Freaking awesome. Wow. That's what I'm, one day I remember a big insurance company, everybody around the world knows it's a very, very big insurance company. And their board meeting, they had a board meeting talking about Dedicated myself. Yeah. And it leaked to me because one of the people there followed my content and they were diehard value tainers. So it came to me and they called me this. I just want to let you know, I think it's important for you to know. Can't tell you who I am. This is what happened. Here's a wow. part of the recording. And I was like, whoa. Wow. Okay. You're talking about us? That's guaranteed. We're coming there soon. Maybe a year, two years, three years, five years, it will. So pay more attention to what these guys are saying about you. They feel threatened. Because when it's, it's either a threat or a confirmation. That you're, you're on the right track. That you're going to be here soon, right? Hey, listen, that guy, that girl is going to be here very soon. These guys, if they say stuff, it's like my eight-year-old son saying something. Can you imagine if I get upset at a kid saying something to you? Like, if you get upset at these guys, you're eight years old. That gave me the biggest, like, calmness I felt for a while. Yeah. I never you want these guys way. to talk smack about you, to say stuff about you. That's like, that's when you're winning. Not the, the guys, they're supposed to do it. I mean, do you think they're supposed yeah. to be happy with the fact that you're exposing why they shouldn't be at the level and at one point you guys were at the same level in high school? No, it's expected. I totally get it. I totally understand. Objection. I have no hard feelings towards you. Totally fair. Sure. But man, I want to hear from these guys. Wow. No, I truly like, it's like almost like a sense of calm came into my mind. That's powerful. So um, something that I resonated with reading your book, you said in your mindset is pat versus pat. That's what affects you at times. Now, my brain, if you see inside of my brain, is constantly on the go. And I've always grown up thinking that, um, I've, I've always felt like the underdog. I felt like I've, I've never done good enough. Now, if you ask my childhood friends, they'll say, Lillian, that's really literally not the reality. <laughs> you were like the protagonist. I was like, no, but in my brain, like that's how I felt. It's great. To feel like the underdog? Oh, yeah, it's great to feel that way. <clears throat> Listen, don't get me wrong. I am very confident, mm. very confident, but I'm also very paranoid. It's a very weird uh, uh, combination. <laughs> that in very, very confident. Not too many things makes me uncomfortable about, you know, but 
I'm also very much knowing, hey, like, you know, uh, when my dad was 78 uh, and he's living in, the, in L.A. Mm -hmm. and he wasn't living in Dallas, you know, he would come once a month and he would be with us for four days. And of the four days he would be with us, I would only see him two days because I'm on the road. So, so then I did the math. I said, my dad's 78. If he lives to 80, he's turning 81 in two months. But he lives, if he lives to 80, I have, with my dad, only 48 days left where I'm going to spend time with him. I don't have two years left. Too many times we think it's two years. It's not two years, 48 days. If my dad lives to 85, well, then that's, you know, 24 times 5, which is what, 120. I got 168 days left in seven years. It ain't seven years. I got 168 days left. My son, I love Christmas. And I, I, I don't hold back with Christmas. You know, we spend money in Christmas and we invest and we just want to enjoy each other's company. My 10-year-old son is about to turn 11 on February 1st. You know how many more Christmases I got with him that he's going to want to be around me no matter what? That I control? Eight more. After eight, I don't control. He controls. This is after when he's 18. Because he may have a girl and she's going to say, let's go to my family. So that's going to mm -hmm. drive me insane, but it's going to happen. I'm naive if I don't think that's going to happen. Because he's going to want to spread his wings and go build his own family, right? We're going to go through that. So that's the part where, you know, when you sit there and you think about certain things that you're, you know, you're, you're building with your family and time that you have, you do not have as much time as you think with your family. So, yes, highly confident and highly paranoid because we don't have a lot of time left. I want to shine a light on Armenia and what's happening. So it's been nearly 40 days that the main road to Artsakh has been blocked and that's the main road that brings in food and medicine and things like that, medical supplies. So I feel like a lot of the diaspora is in a bit of a, you know, confused state. They live their life here or, you know, anywhere across the world, but they want to help Armenia. What's your advice to them? How can we raise our voices? How can we bring, shed more light to Armenia? I mean, you know, so let's process how we can contribute. It's tragic what's going on over there. Guy sent me a message on LinkedIn, Armenian guy who's a lawyer over there and saying, let me tell you what's going on. I got my dad there. I got my son there. I got my sister there. I got my family there. Here's how many days they're going without medicine, without this. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it is not the situation to be in, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So how can we help? One is by talking about it, creating awareness. Great. Two is sending money. Great. Which charity do you trust to send the money that ends up going to them? Biggest criticism when you send money to sometimes Armenians, Assyrians, Iranians, you don't know where the money ends up going, mm -hmm. okay? if it ends up going to them. This is why some of the charities, we were doing a big charity, we'd raise Breast Cancer Awareness Month and we would do all Susan G. Komen, hey, did you know 68% of money goes towards, you know, their expenses. Only 32% goes towards research and all this other, and these numbers that you look at, right? Okay, all right, should we not send money? No, we should send money. Should we not talk about it? No, we should talk about it. But my interest is a long-term solution, not short-term solution. I think when you sit there and uh, Armenia decides to team up with China, which makes sense because they allow China to come in, they allow Russia to come in, and then Russia's in the middle. Putin's trying to sit there and protect Pashinyan and Armenia, but at the same time, he knows Turkey is the most strongest military in the Middle East, and Erdogan is not a lightweight guy. He's a very strong guy, and he's got allies with the U.S. in a weird way that U.S. is still very careful with them. So that's the part where strategically Armenia has to really make an effort to get tight and get support from somebody new that's really going to be defending them that is not a fan of Turkey. Because Azerbaijan can do whatever the hell they want to do because the back end is who? Turkey. Mm -hmm. So they're going to come in here and say, yeah, no, we got, we got the, you know, their back. And Armenia is going to go to Putin and Putin's going to say what? Well, guys, try to kind of make it work and Putin's not going to take a position. If he takes Armenia's position... Turkey's going to say, what are you doing? If he takes Turkey's position, the Armenians and Russia are going to say, what are you doing? So he, he becomes way too diplomatic, mm. Putin. He's, he's in an interesting spot himself right now, while the world hates him because they don't know the whole story and he's getting bashed for what's going on with Ukraine. We only know one side of the story because mainstream media is only telling us one side. We don't know all the stories. It may be true. Mm. It may not be true. So it, it's, it's happening at the worst possible time, and this is going to sound weird. If Azerbaijan ever found a time to really impose themselves on Armenia, this is the time to do it. It's tragic. This is the time to do it because Russia's distracted and mm -hmm. Turkey's not. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very important 
war and conquering areas and winning is about timing. They have time on their side. If they miss this opportunity, obviously as an Armenian, you want them to not watch this podcast so they miss this opportunity. You want them to not be thinking this way, just to miss the opportunity. But Armenians need to realize they need to build better alliances long-term that protect them. Uh, they don't have the right protection right now from America. I know Nancy Pelosi went out there and visited, but what happened? Who's gone there since? What's going on now? What are we expecting now? Nothing. So short term, do whatever you can to get past this time. But why does this keep repeating yeah. and rehashing and re-showing up? That has to do with the political leaders not making the right decision, the right alliances, the right partnerships. That problem shouldn't show up. You know, in life, if you keep having the same health issue because you don't want to eat or drink or stop smoking and you keep smoking cigarettes, why are you surprised you have lung cancer? Mm -hmm. I don't understand why you're surprised. Nobody should be surprised. If Armenia keeps trying to build the same alliances with the same people that don't have their back fully when an issue like this happens, well, apparently they don't fear your backing. If they feared your backing, that would have never happened. So anyways, I'm not running for office. I'm not insinuating anything like that. All I'm saying is there needs to be a leader that they need to sincerely think about long-term alliances to build because if they don't, they're not getting any stronger. And here's what's weird about it. Armenian engineers, they're some of the best in the world right now. Coders, technology, the level of intelligence, what they're producing there, it's insane. With, I can't tell you how many uh, technology companies are using engineers from Armenia because of how good they are at their work. I mean, this, this, is, this is something that doesn't get highlighted enough, but they have the right uh, um, opportunity to do something big. This is not a call out to Pashinyan. This is a call out to whoever you vote next or somebody that's watching this that actually wants to get involved in politics. Think about long-term solutions, not short-term. You don't have a lot of time. Well said. One more, yes, okay, so one more thing. I always say that um, my biggest thing is dreams come to those who have the power to give them life. What's one dream that you have to give life to that you haven't for the next five to 10 years? What dream? Yeah, that you have to give life to because it came to you for a reason. Oh, I mean, a couple of them I can't uh, publicly talk about it because they're, they're political, but uh, it's, it's all of them are around the kids. Oh. They're all, they're, they're, okay. a, a lot of them are around the kids. You know, the, for me, I feel like, you know, I wasn't born here, so I can't run for office. That's something that's eliminated purely out of what I need to do. But we're going to build some incredible leaders. So the dreams are around what the David family is going to do the next 40 years. That's more than I'm sure if anyone's going to do it, it's you and your family. Um, any questions for us? In the meantime, I'm going to give you a gift from Australia. Oh, awesome. By the way, I love the accent, man. This, I can listen to this accent. Thanks. Do you have the accent too, or you don't have the accent? Not really? A little bit? Okay. <laughs> this is for you. A little bit? I'm trying so, to hear it if you have it. You and your kids and your wife, Australian snacks, Vegemite. Do, I, should I, I don't know if you want to open it or not, but... Oh, my, it's what? It's a bunch of candy? Uh, no, Vegemite from Australia. Have you tried Vegemite before? Let me see what it is. What is the... It's like Marmite. You have to have it. But listen, you have to have it with butter. So oh, I can't wait for this. And then Tim Tams for your kids, they have to dunk it in milk and then bite both sides and then sit, use it like a straw. And Australian um, licorice, wine. things like that. Wine. Got to be kidding me. Well, thank you so much for of this. Course. This is amazing. Of course. Thank you. Oh, yeah, and coasters for your wife, like, and for like alcohol or. I love it. Fantastic. Australia. But that's, you see, that's the part about the Armenian etiquette that, you know, that special touch that we have. You know, when I was in the army, I ran into a guy who was Armenian who used to be in a gang in Glendale. Okay. And we run into each other at PX. The last time him and I talked, we got into a fight. But when we saw each other, we walked up, we hugged, we kissed on the cheek, and it was like inseparable. There's some richness in the Armenian culture that it's great to see everywhere. But thank you so much, Arax. Truly, thank you. Appreciate you guys, and thank you as well. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you for yes, having me. Yes, you're going places. I'm excited for you. Thank you. Yes. That means the world to me. Thank, thank you. you. Macy, thank you.